That's true. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Authors Anything, the YA middle grade Q&A series devoted to famous writers, favorite books, and fangirling, and in this case, fanboying, because we have our we have smart girls and smart boys together for the first time, which I think is awesome. I'm Megan McCafferty, and I'm proud and happy to be able to write uh, both books for young adults and middle grade readers. And while I think it's important sometimes to make a distinction between such age categories to help to get the right books in the right hands, I think that the very best books for young people can be enjoyed by anyone at any age. And that's exactly how I feel whenever I read the work of this month's guest. Um, her debut novel, First Light, does anybody have a copy of First Light that you can hold up? Oh, no, it's First Light. Okay. Well, First Light ingeniously explores the power of science science fiction, and storytelling. It was a Junior Library Guild selection, a Book Sense pick for children, a New York Public Library book for the teenage, and an International Reading Association notable book. And she was just getting started, people, because her next book, When You Reach Me, hold that one up, because I know you guys have that one, When You Reach Me, <laughs> yay! It's one of those books that I don't like to say too much about, and you guys all know why, because you've all read it, because I think one of its greatest joys is how it takes you by surprise. And I don't want to be a spoily spoilerton, so I'm not going to say too much about it, but let's just suffice it to say that it was one of those books that as soon as I finished it, I went right back to the beginning to figure out how the author did what she did. When You Reach Me is a blockbuster bestseller and won a whole slew of awards, including the Newbery Award for, uh, from the American Library Association, which is the award that is considered the most distinguished book uh, to the contribution of literature for children. Her newest book, Liar and Fi, yep, pull that one up, is another brilliant, twisty, turny read with characters worth caring about. It made a bunch of year-end best of lists and taught me the word umami. <laughs> among other things. So please, welcome to the show, the inventive and entertaining Rebecca Stead. <laughs> and for the first, but definitely not the last time, we are joined uh, from, with, by my co-hosts from John Witherspoon Middle School in Princeton, New Jersey. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here today. You'll all have an opportunity to ask Rebecca questions, but I have to do a little fangirling first. So, Rebecca, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we met very briefly a few years ago at the awesome Princeton Public Library Children's Book Festival. Um, I was buying my first copy of When You Reach Me for my niece, and I think I mentioned that I've gone on to buy at least a half a dozen other copies that I've given away because it's like one of my favorite gifts to give. Um, I didn't get to chat with you that much that day because you had a long line of people and I didn't want to be like that annoying person hogging up all of the author's time. So I'm happy to have a half an hour to talk to you now, even if I have to share that time with my co-host. 30 minutes goes by really quickly when you can't mess with the space-time continuum. So I'm going to jump right in. And um, so you started out as an attorney, as a public offender. Do you... Do you apply any of your courtroom skills to your work as a writer? Um, no, I really don't think so. Um, I was mostly a public defender, mm -hmm. and um, it's a job that requires a lot of thinking on your feet and juggling. And actually, that's sort of the opposite of writing, right? I mean, in writing, you don't really have to think on your feet. You can sit there forever. Right. And, you know, there's very little juggling. It's mostly, you know, me and the wall and the laptop. So, yeah, I don't see a lot. I don't see a lot of connection. But, I mean, that's probably why you were drawn, why you were drawn to writing or why that was, we were able to steal you away from the world of law. Yeah. And, and, and we're all grateful for that. It's, less, it's a lot less hectic. That's for sure. And when I started, I had really young children, which, as we know, when I started writing, um, I was still a public defender, and my kids were just tiny, tiny. And, you know, tiny kids are incredibly lovely, but somewhat hectic. So yes. writing is a nice counterpoint, you know, to that. 
So let's talk about your writing. So writing wasn't your original career path. So let's get a question, uh, two questions from Brenda about your beginnings. Okay. Um, how old were you when you started writing and what were your first stories like? Well, so the questions are how old was I when I started writing and what were my first stories like? Um, I started writing in elementary school and I, I have to say that I only wrote when I had to. In other words, I didn't go home and write for my own pleasure. Um, I read for my own pleasure. I read like crazy, but I wasn't writing a lot back then. So I wrote sort of what I was assigned to write. And the first story that I ever completed, I, I, wrote, I began a couple of stories that I never bothered to finish. Um, and that, it turns out, is something that plagues us, you know, writers throughout our lives. But um, was a story actually about a girl who found these candies in the woods and she very intelligently um, put one in her mouth immediately because we all know that if you find a candy wrapped up you know in the dirt you should just immediately put it in your mouth. <laughs> and um, what she found is that when she ate the candy she could hear animals and it actually took a friend of mine for me a friend of mine said, did you ever think about the fact she actually was in my sixth grade class. She said, did you ever think about the fact that your first story was about a girl who could hear animals and then your first book was about a girl who could understand animals? Wow. Um, which is one aspect of my first book, First Light. And I had never thought of it, but it's true. But honestly, I think that is the only story I completed um, till probably senior year of high school. And that wow. was sixth grade. So I was 11. I was 11. Well, I, you know, that's so refreshing to hear because I think a lot of um, writers or aspiring writers get intimidated when they hear about writers who are like, oh, I write every single day and I write and I had, you know, a million short stories written by the time I was 10 years old. And, and yep. I think it's, it's interesting to hear that different writers have different paths to becoming professional writers. And, um, and I do think that one um, key, one universal, is to be a writer, you have to be a passionate reader. And that is one thing that I have found that all, every writer that I've ever talked to, they, they may not have really developed their, their, the practice of writing until they got older, but one mm -hmm. thing that, that is universal is a love of reading. And so... Um, I absolutely agree with you, but I actually have a couple of friends who didn't even like reading until wow. until high school maybe um, and they both um, had challenges when it came to reading and so reading wasn't really enjoyable for a long time so I always say you know just because you're not writing you're not the kid in your class with you know a six foot stack of your stories that doesn't mean if you have the urge to write you know then I think you're hopefully destined to write and even if reading is something that you come to later um, that's absolutely great. I mean, I know one person who, who came to it, read all of the children's books that she's now read as an adult because she wow. really didn't read when she was a child. And now she's really passionate about both. So I don't think it's a door that really closes. That's great. I, I, that's, that's such a great point. And I think that that's, um, like I said, very encouraging for people. It's encouraging for me to hear, too. Because there was phases yeah. that I went through I don't. I didn't read that much for pleasure in high school. I stopped reading for, for pleasure. So I think that you come in and out of phases. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you you found great success writing for an age group that I feel like sometimes gets overlooked. Um, so Maritza has a question that concerns finding your audience. Okay. Yeah. How did you decide to write for middle grade readers? Well, this is a tricky one because you know what? I really didn't. Um, I, I never sat down and said, I'm going to write a story for middle graders. I didn't even know what middle grade meant when I started writing. I mean, I didn't know what group of kids that referred to. Um, I started writing the kinds of stories that I thought I would enjoy writing and, you know, sort of like what what felt true to me emotionally and a lot of um, I remember a lot of emotion from like I, a lot of how I felt in sort of fifth and sixth grade and seventh grade 
And so that is, I think, why I write about those years, is I remember those years so well. And I also remember a lot of what I thought about. And I think that I had, um, like most kids that age, I think, I had a lot of deep questions at, at those ages. And then I became a teenager. And frankly, my questions became a little less deep. <laughs> and I feel like when I was in fifth and sixth and seventh grade, I was asking myself questions that um, that I still now, at age 46, don't have the answers to. And so it's still interesting for me to write about those questions. Um, and so I think that's why I write um, for the age group that I do. But somebody else had to tell me. An editor had to tell me, oh, by the way, you're writing for what we call middle graders. And I said, oh, great. But one thing I never do is, um, consciously condescend to my readers. So yeah. I'm writing to you as if you're me, frankly. Yeah. You know, and I consider myself smart and I consider you smart. And so I never think, oh, this is for children. You know, make sure it's written in a particular way. I I write it the way I would write it for anyone. I mean, you know, myself mainly. I, I agree. Like I, I write the books that I would have liked to have read at that age, but also would would like to read now. Like yeah. it's and like I said earlier, like I think the best books can kind of transcend age and and genre, and so that does it doesn't surprise me that 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 because I feel like the age categories usually come from a marketing point of view, not from a storytelling point of view. Um, yeah, I I think that's probably true. But to some, I mean, it's just a practical thing, really, and it's you know semi necessary, I guess, but. I would say that whatever I'm reading, whether it's a picture book or a middle grade book or a YA book or an, a, an adult novel that's won some huge literary prize, um, I always look for sort of some truth in the story, you know, some sense that the author is, is trying to tell me something that feels true to the writer. And the last thing I ever want to see is condescension. Yeah. I'm reading a book for children and I get any whiff of, of condescension, like bending over to a, you know, talk down to a reader, I, I usually can't finish the book. So you guys are in the, like, JW, you guys are in, do you realize you're in the midst of this is such exciting time in your lives right now? I mean, you're probably thinking, like, what are these people talking about? But it's true. Like, this is, like, a really cool place where you are right now. So embrace it and enjoy it. Um, so all of your novels, especially, but especially when you reach me, are so intricately crafted. Um, every little detail matters, and you may not realize why until the very end. And I wondered, I wondered how much of your work is spontaneous and how much is planned. Um, and I'm not the only one who's curious about your process. Um, so Lily has a question about how you plot your books. Okay. In general, how do you come up with a main storyline? Okay, so in general, the way I come up with the main storyline is that I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know, if, have you guys heard of plotting and plunging? Plotters versus plungers. So plotters plan ahead, and plungers just start writing and hope that it all works out. Um, and I'm a plunger. So I start with some germ of an idea, um, something in my head that I want to write about, but it could be a feeling about a friendship between two characters, or it could be, you know, a funny mind puzzle kind of, but um, it's something small, usually. And I, I just, it's a, it's a leap of faith. And I just start writing scenes. And I, I usually come to know my characters and my story by writing it. And that means that I revise a lot. And it means that I um, cut a lot of scenes eventually. But first I generate a lot of material, and then I kind of pare it back and shorten it and rearrange it endlessly until my editor says, you know, that's enough and takes it away from me. Um, and Emily, um, do you want to add to this question? Um, yeah, what were your favorite and least favorite parts of the book and why? Of When You Reach Me? Yeah. Um, Favorite and least favorite. Let's see. 
This book is really based in a lot of ways on my own um, life as a sixth grader. So this is my most personal book, and in a way, um, that was a great gift to myself. Like I sort of said to myself, I'm going to use all of these details that I remember about where I grew up and, you know, how I grew up. And so that's my school and my apartment and. Um, the, the laughing man was someone that I passed on my way to school um, most days, and um, the, the sandwich place, Jimmy's, is, is in reality was a Subway Sandwiches on 95th and Broadway where I worked every day at lunch when I was in sixth grade. And um, so I think that it was my favorite part of writing that book was being able to kind of put those memories down on paper and be able to sort of um, capture what it felt like for me to be, you know, a kid at that time of my life. Um, it was sort of, it was just fun. Um, and I love the puzzle aspect of the book because I have always loved um, sort of little impossible puzzles and um, I like thinking about time travel and how it might work. Um, so, I don't it's really hard to ask to think about my least favorite part of that book. I will tell you my least favorite part of that book probably, this might be a cop out, but so Miranda's mom is preparing for the $20,000 pyramid and honestly the hardest, one of the hardest things was figuring out how to get the rules into the book without bogging down the, the story and making it really boring. And um, during copy editing, we had a lot of back and forth about how the rules of the game actually worked because that was, you, you, have you guys heard of the $20,000 pyramid? It was a real game. I didn't make it up. Um, so getting technical information into books is not my strong point. I'm much more interested in relationships and character and emotion and things like that. Well, I, I actually wondered if you were at all concerned with including retro pop culture references, whether they would connect with the, with the contemporary readers, which actually is the perfect segue for th this next question from Akira. Why did you choose to use the $20,000 pyramid in your book instead of any other game show? That is a good question, and here's the answer. Well, two reasons. One, my mom was on the $20,000 pyramid when I was oh, awesome. and I <laughs> How did you do? How did you do? I have to interrupt you. We lost. Um, oh. And guess who we blamed? We blamed who? celebrity partner. Who was her partner? Um, he was this actor who was on that TV show, Soap. Do you remember that TV show? Sure. Um, Long, the, kids have, the kids are lost now. I know. I'm so, okay, I'm sorry, kids. But... Was he the blondish guy who's like not? The guy who played Father Tim. Okay, anyway, that's exciting. Anyway, okay. Proceed. So, yeah, we blame him. She did not make it to the to the sec to the, the winner's circle, which right. was sad because we did have a list of things that we were gonna be getting if she won the money. Um, in fact what we got were consolation prizes. We got a like a box of dentine gum. And we got a box of panel magic, which is like to clean your wood paneling, which in New York we don't really have wood paneling. But um, anyway, so, um, you know, as I just said, I used a lot from my own childhood. And I remember the feeling of walking into that theater when she was about to compete. And I remember looking at all the stuff on the stage and thinking, it all looks so fake, you know. I, I feel like I could go over and just kick over that pyramid. It just it looked like a big styrofoam prop. And it made an impression on me, and I felt like writing about it. And um, then I justified my decision because you know what? You often have the urge to throw stuff in. A lot gets thrown into a story in a first draft that then has to come out because it just doesn't grow right. It doesn't connect. But um, I left it in because a, it was a really good way, from a craft point of view, of reminding the reader when the present of the book was. Because the book sort of has a past story and a present story. And so in many of the present time story pieces, um, there's a reference to her mom practicing for the game show. Yeah. And the second reason, or third reason, I've lost count, is that um, for me, this story ended up being, now this is me looking back, 
but about categories and how we're always putting people in categories and assuming that we know who they are. This is this person is this type of person and that person is that type of person and a, a homeless man who acts crazy on your corner is a certain kind of person and you make assumptions about everybody, you know, the rich kid in your class or you know, or the homeless guy in your corner and what's happening for Miranda throughout the story is really a lot of her assumptions are being kind of exploded. And um, so I then decided that I earned a place in my story for the $20,000 pyramid because it's all about categories. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know if I persuaded you or not, but that's my well, story. <laughs> That was one of my favorite shows that I, when I would be home from school sick, uh, I, would, I would watch, I would love, because you could play along. That's why I really liked it. It's so. actually incredibly fun. Kids, if you, kids, JW kids, you can YouTube episodes of $20,000 Pyramid and you can see what we're talking about. And you you're can gonna actually be... play it. You can make it yourself and play it. You can just, it's so easy to do. And it's very fun. You will end up shrieking, I guarantee you. So, um, question from... Carolyn, about another reference in, in the novel. Okay. Um, Miranda loves to reread A Wrinkle in Time. Do you have a favorite book you'd like to read again and again? Um, I like to reread a lot of books, but um, that was one of my favorite books when I was a kid. And um, I did reread it. Uh, I reread that book a lot. And one of the reasons that I have the book in there, aside from maybe like giving the reader a heads up that something a little unusual might be happening in the book they're actually reading, um, is that I wanted to talk a little bit about the way um, I felt about books when I was a kid, which is that I felt they were my personal worlds. And in fact, just like Miranda, I kind of didn't like it when other people talked about a book that I loved because it felt kind of like a violation. I sort of felt like, you know, whoa, why are you talking about my um, sort of private, it was almost like I felt like I was in a private, you know, um, world that I didn't really like to think about other people coming and tramping all over. Um, and that's why to this day I really can't be in book clubs. I just, I don't really like to hear about other people reading the books I love sometimes. <laughs> Maybe I'll outgrow that. Um, it's never too late. But, uh, so I still you know, love to reread books. Um, and if there's a book that I would read over and over and over, it's probably To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, yeah. Have you guys, have any of you read To Kill a Mockingbird yet? Yeah, okay, so. It's just a great book on so many levels. Just the book from the heart, but it's also a great, smart story, you know? Well, A Wrinkle in Time won the Newbery Medal in 1963, which is the perfect segue for a question from Nima. Great. What did it actually feel like to win the Newbery Award? Um, it felt really, honestly, it felt so weird. It felt sort of surreal. Um, you know, when, when, if you win that, they call you really early in the morning and it's a morning in January, and so in New York City, early in the morning in January, it's still dark out. And so your phone rings in the dark, and you have like 15 people on speaker phone, and some of them are almost crying because they have put so much work into their year of reading. And this is their call to not just the, the winner, but the all of the honor books. And um, it's incredibly... It was moving and exciting, but it also just didn't seem real for a long time. I'm, that's my honest feeling. It did not feel real for a while because I just thought, when I looked at the books, like A Wrinkle in Time when the Newbery, you know, and then my book when the Newbery, I just thought, what? No. Get out. But then, I mean, then there's also real life. Like my son that morning had broken something on his braces, so, you know, an hour after the call, I was walking around, my family was all hugging in the dark and and then you know an hour and a half later I was sitting in the orthodontist office so my son could get his you know ring fixed or whatever and so and then 
I don't know, we had a party that night with a lot of really good cake. <laughs> um, that's a thing, like, real life always yeah. comes back in, right? Like, it's just, good. So no matter when these amazing things happen, it comes down to, it, it still is about, like, your butt in the chair with yeah. your laptop, right? It's so about... The work. weird thing about it, right, is that it's so public, yes. and really writing is so private, private. that it feels, yes. feels like, how can this... Be. No one even really knew about this for so long. For years, this was just in my head. Yeah. You know, and now the New York Times is sending a photographer to my house. It's just, it doesn't seem, honestly, I enjoy it more now, I think, than I did then. Because now it's something like I take out of my pocket and think, ooh, not literally. I don't carry right, it. Right, right, right. I just want you to know that. But just that it's like a good feeling that I can reflect on without feeling like, um, you know, too much in the public eye. I'm, well, I'm somewhat shy, actually. Well, that's the thing, you know, we can't control other people's responses to our work. And so, you know, like, if we all gave up every time we didn't win the Newberry, you know, oh, let's say, yeah. like, nobody would write, nobody would write a second book. Like, I, you'd, be, yeah. you'd be done. And so you, the rewards have to come from the work itself, which is often very boring and lonely. Yeah, so, that's why you need friends. Um, so Zachary actually has a question about this. Great. What does your writing day look like? Well, it varies. Um, I always want to know what other writers' writing days look like. That's always the question I want to ask people when I meet them. So how do you do it? Because frankly, it's a daily struggle for me. Um, if I'm working really well, the thing I do, if it's like a regular school day, you know, and not the summer, um, when my younger son leaves the house, which is at about 8, 15 in the morning, um, I will sit down to work immediately. Because if I start doing little things, because I work in my apartment, like right now I'm at my desk, but I'm also in my bedroom. Um, if I start puttering, I'll never get started. So I try to write for as long as I can in a creative mode, which means open-minded, um, my inner sensor is off, right? I'm not, I'm not judging myself harshly, I'm just kind of going for it and not, if I write a horrible sentence or an idea that feels really cliche, I just think, okay, I'll deal with that later and I just keep going. Um, that usually doesn't last more than a couple of hours. And then after that, I turn to other work. So it could be revision, it could be answering interview questions, or, you know, it could be reading, um, or anything. Or it could be having lunch with a friend who's writing and we're talking about writing. But um, creative work for me, I, my best shot is in the morning. But it, it really, it doesn't happen every single day. I'm not at all perfect that way. And it usually doesn't go for more than a couple of hours. So I think some of uh, definitely some of our viewers who are watching this and some of the, and our students from JW are have creative ambitions. So um, we have a question from Ke from Kelvin. Okay. What advice do you have for aspiring writers? Okay. This is a good question and one that I kind of love to answer actually. So my advice for its aspiring writers is number one. Read. Um, I. It sounds like one of these things, like you know, eat vegetables, or yeah, you've heard it a thousand times, and it kind of goes one ear in one ear and out the other. But reading is the key. I mean, I think if you want to write, you could read for the next twenty years before you even start writing, and that would be great. That would be like a terrific way to approach writing. Um, if you're already writing, that's fantastic. But reading, as we said, is I think the, the one necessary, eventually, the one necessary ingredient. Um, and the second thing is just never to judge your first draft too harshly. There's a certain amount of um, flailing that goes on with writing. And I think that a lot of people think, well, if I were a professional writer, um, and I were writing a story, I would get to the end and I would have a good story. 
And that's just not true, honestly, for like 99% of the people I know who are writing as their jobs. That is just not true. I mean, we all feel disappointment with what happens early in the process. And so you have to kind of, um, you know, get your armor on. You have to be a little tough and say to yourself, I'm not going to be discouraged because I'm only at that stage in the beginning that every writer has to grapple with. So if you feel disappointed, don't look at anything you've done and think, oh, well, I guess I'm not a writer. The truth is, you, you are a writer. That's exactly what writers do. And oh, yeah. that is honestly just as important as reading. Because I know, I've had so many people say to me, I wish I could write, but when I do it, it's not good. And I always find that they have not been willing to revise. That they want it to be immediate gratification. And, you know, it takes me two to three years to write a book that's about 200 pages. There is so much below average writing that goes into that process, <laughs> I can't even, I don't even know how to, I would describe it. So those are my two, my two pieces of advice. Well, we're almost out of time, and so I have to ask, what are you working on now? I am working on Get ready, a middle grade novel. Yay! Uh, it's, um, it's slightly older, and um, I would say that um, so it's about seventh grade girls, mostly. And um, I can't talk about it yet, but it's, it's definitely different from what I've done before. I try to sort of do something different every time. That's how I stay engaged. Um, and so, I don't know, I hope you like it when I finish it, which I hope will be um, sometime this fall. Hey, well, I've been writing about seventh grade girls. Are lately. you? Oh, so, yes. So, I can't wait to see how you, how you do it and I, how, what I can learn from you. Um, so, our, our, our time is up. Okay. Oh, up. Um, which is sad to me. Um, and Ask Authors Anything is taking off. We're taking off for the month of August. But the good news is that we'll be back in September with not one, but two episodes. On Friday, September 19th, my guest will be debut author Cami McGovern, whose book, I can't really say it, Ooh. Say What You Will, came out last month to rave reviews. So it'll be interesting to hear from her about what it's been like to get her first novel published. And then on Tuesday, September 16th, our guest will be me. That's right. Me. Celebrating the publication of my own book. My second book in my Jessica Darling series. Jessica Darling's It List 2. The Totally Not Guaranteed Guide to Friends, Foes, and Fellow Friends. Uh, it's coming out on that day. And I will be interviewed by somebody that we both know, Rebecca. I'll be interviewed by my friend and fellow Jersey girl, the author of A Mango Shaped Space and The Candy Maker. Oh, yes. Wendy Mass. Wendy Mass. Yay. Yay. So you guys should probably know who Wendy Mass is. So she's going to be turning the tables on me on September 16th. So I hope that you'll join us in September. Until then, please keep turning the pages or swiping the screen. However, and whatever you read, just keep on reading because readers like you are why Rebecca and I do what we do. So thank you so much for joining, and we hope that you come back for future episodes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.